Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, IBS Intelligence uh, WebEx on Artificial Intelligence and Big Data. Um, we're here to, uh, to, to host uh, uh, two, uh, two panelists, uh, Mr. Ram Narasimha, who's the Global Head of AI and Cognitive Services at Sibia, and uh, also Ravi Subramanian, Subramanian Senior Vice President and Head of Banking Practices of Four Hexaware Technologies. Uh, my name is uh, Vincenzo Basilo. I'm a principal at Cedar Management Consulting uh, for the FS practice. And uh, I will lead you through this, uh, this presentation. So the presentation will be physically structured in three pieces. So we have uh, the first part, which will be my introduction. Uh, I will uh, just, uh, I will have a couple of slides uh, regarding what artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence actually is, what big data is. Um, so very academic slides, I will try to make them crisp so that nobody gets, uh, gets bored during the session. And then we will get into the, the application of AI for in financial, in financial services and key technologies used. And also we will have a look at the uh, key initiatives and in GCC countries of AI and, uh, and big data. So we'll move on. Okay. So um, when we talk about artificial intelligence and big data, let's introduce the concept. So before, before jumping into the, into the straightforward definition, we can start putting some clarity around the idea of AI by dividing it into two high level categories. So we have what is called general AI, or so uh, known as broad AI or strong AI, which is the idea of a machine that entirely fuses humans' ability to perform a wide variety of tasks, conduct generalized reasoning, um, applying common sense, and solving problems creatively. Uh, in essence, is what we see now only in science fiction. So uh, I think we, are, we, we have still, still to wait a few decades to see it uh, thoroughly applied to financial services and um, it, uh, daily, daily technologies. With respect to the second, second category, we get into the narrow AI. So narrow AI is instead the ability of addressing a highly specific problem, uh, like for example, identifying an object in a photo or winning a chess game. Now, a, a good question that people may be thinking is, why does AI really matter? Well, if you think about it, even with most traditional computing techniques, no humans or group of humans could effectively analyze staggering volumes of data created every day and detect patterns, derive insights, and drive actions. So essentially, AI, it is the only tool at our disposal to do that. And this is not only for the sheer scale of data generated, but also due to the fact that such data is raw in a structure. So giving some also some basic notions about what, what unstructured and structured data is. So when we look at unstructured data, unstructured data has no predefined model or organization. For instance, uh, the millions of photos uh, that are exchanged randomly or the hours of conversations amongst, among stockbrokers uh, or also all those emails exchanged between servers are a typical example of unstructured data. Um, when we go to structured data instead, structured data can be codified, it can be placed into spreadsheets, it can be sorted. For example, if you think about um, income statements uh, or historical temperature or, or records of transactions, these are all um, examples of structured data. Now, going to uh, an essential component in AI, well, we get into learning. So there are three major, major techniques of learning. The first one is supervised learning. What is supervised learning? Well, supervised learning in essence provides the model being trained with data that has been structured and labeled by humans and where a clear objective has been defined, has been outlined. The second category is unsupervised learning. So Training data has no preset instructions or labels set by humans, but allow the model, model to identify its structures, uh, its patterns, and identify its groupings. 
Um, then go, we go to, into the third category of, of learning, which is reinforcement learning. Well, reinforcement learning scores the performance of variations in a model against an objective to determine which model works best for a given data set. So these are, in a nutshell, uh, the three, the three uh, definitions of um, the, the key notions of learning, okay? Now, when we get into now the definition of, uh, of AI, well, AI in essence is nothing more than an umbrella term, an umbrella term that encompasses many different approaches. Um, uh, we will see later, we have the several techniques, uh, machine learning, neural networks, genetic and evolutionary algorithms. And these approaches, they seek to achieve a wide array of specific, of specific goals. For example, uh, again, identifying an object in a photo, uh, translating a language, or, or predicting a behavior. When we go, go into big data, big data itself is a field that studies the ways to analyze, extract information, or um, deal with data sets that are too large or complex to be dealt with traditional data processing application software. And, and we can say that big data leverages it like AI techniques to do so. So this is, um, in, a, in a nutshell, what AI is just to introduce the, the concept. So moving forward into the techniques of AI. Well, here is a, so there is, there is no, um, there is no exact definitions about the clustering on, on how properly you can cluster the different uh, AI techniques av available uh, on the market. Anyways, uh, I attempted to classify them into three, three major blocks. Uh, the first one is machine learning. Um, uh, machine learning is actually no, not new. I mean, we're, we're, we're hearing a lot nowadays uh, about it, but that term is quite old. It dates back, it dates back 1959 by Arthur Samuel. Samuel was a computer science, uh, scientist. And what machine learning does in essence, machine learning parses existing data, learns insights from it, and makes a prediction based on that learning. So it is not a learning in the sense that a human being learns, but we can think it in the line of best fit in a sample regression model, which improves whenever a new data point is added. Now we go to the second, the second one, neural networks, which sounds very fancy and complicated, but I will, I will try to make it, uh, to make it simple. So uh, neural networks resembles the way a human brain works. So, as neurons in the human brains are connected to each other via synapses, the process of an individual learning is a shifting of strength of the connections at those synapse points. So to put it simple, networks are constituted, constituted by three types of units. You got the input layer, which receives various data inputs with any type of structured and unstructured data as explained earlier. Then we've got the final one, which is the output layer, which provides the results such as predictions or decisions. And then we have the hidden units, hidden units that typically provide layers of connectivity between input units and output units. So in essence, neural networks learn by reweighting the connections between artificial neurons. Then we go to the, the, the third and final one, and hope, hopefully uh, everyone is still as not fell as, asleep. Um, the, third, the third point is genetic and evolutionary algorithms. So genetic and evolutionary algorithms um, apply the principles of evolution found in nature. So there are different models created and only those that produce the best results survive. So in essence, a new generation of algorithms is created alongside the surviving ones. And this happened through mutations. So you mutate adding new portions of the code being introduced. And the selection process is run again and again to produce a best uh, of breed um, algorithm. So now the, the uh, I would say that the, um, uh, the most immediate question that they would, or the, the most immediate um, um, uh, comment that anyone would think after having thought about how complex these models can be would be, okay, so 
the best would be to have the most complex complex model to have the best result. Well, it's not exactly like that because actually complexity raises two big concerns. And I explain you why. So first of all, we have resource, constra resource constraints. As models complexity increase, so do the resources required to operate it. And there is a trade-off between marginal improvement in predictive result and increased cost in terms of resources. And we call about, to think in essence about electricity and uh, human talents. And then we have also the black box, black box effect. The uh, black box effect, see, whenever a complexity increases in the model, it becomes difficult to get an understanding why a model resulted in a given output. And as you can imagine, this raises concerns, the main rate concerns uh, uh, for uh, a lot of financial regulators who need to understand what is the root cause of such a decision. Okay, so uh, having said that, I am done with the academic uh, introduction of the concepts of the AI, and I will move ahead talking about the key opportunities for financial institutions. So opportunities where AI technologies uh, can, uh, can provide benefit can, can be basically classified into four clusters, okay? So number one, we have automation. So financial institutions can improve the speed and efficiency with which a process can be completed by reducing or altogether eliminating human intervention. So what happens is that this reduces in turns operational costs, uh, may improve customer experience. Um, automation can be definitely enabled with RPA, which is robotic process automation, as, lo as long as inputs do not deviate from expectation. Then machine vision and advanced pattern recognition systems with self-learning capability can be deployed for more complex processes uh, with more varied uh, inputs. And then we get into customization. When we talk about customization, it is possible to receive highly customized financial products and services in, uh, for example, in wealth management and wholesale banking, which are typically accessible to those able to pay higher fees as typically required human intervention. AI can break this paradigm, can break this, this trade-off um, and enables personalized financial product at zero marginal cost once a system is in place. So think about a very easy example, the rogue advisors. Then we go into the third category, this, uh, the improved decision-making. So financial institutions can incorporate broader and less structured data sets into their analytics processes enabling foresights, uh, for example, by improving the ability to better understand how a certain situation will evolve, which can be seen riding alone um, and sharing a car or simply placing bets on the market next move. Then we'll get into the, into the fourth category. The fourth category is about new value propositions. So financial institutions may find it is in possession of a unique set of data streams uh, that place that financial institution in an advantageous position either to deploy uh, monetizable insights such as more detailed macroeconomic reports uh, to suites of AI services uh, that support automation like uh, customization and decision-making aims for other financial institutions. So artificial intelligence as such becomes an opportunity for financial institutions and themselves to provide other services to others. So moving to the next Yeah. So moving to the uh, applications uh, of AI in subsectors of financial services. So definitely there is a massive application into lending. Why? Uh, first of all, because um, it's possible to read, it, it allows to reduce the cost of processing loan applications and improve the speed of loans deployment. Um, uh, key technologies there used are natural language processing and machine vision. Um, they support, uh, uh, support verification of, 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 for example, of prospective clients, uh, domain, uh, clients documentation, uh, accelerate KYC uh, and reduce fraud. 
The same technologies are also applied to support loans to small and mid-sized businesses. Uh, work can enable the ingestion of non-standardized documents like, like financials. Uh, so this removes the need for manual processing and data analysis. Then underwriting models can improve decision-making around lending activities, for example, by including forward-looking indicators about a prospective borrower's ability to repay, uh, potentially reducing the number of non-performing loans, but they can also increase the pool of potential customers by using alternative data signals uh, to assess the credit worthiness wherever uh, uh, traditional credit agency data may not be available. So big data here supports with a range of new sources such as bill payments, social media, media posts, um, uh, shopping behaviors, which can be used, viewed by, used by financial institutions to develop new models. Then also integrations with prospective borrowers IT systems such as accounting supply chain management system can enable real time data flows, uh, which anticipate the lending needs. Then going to wealth and asset management. Uh, uh, natural language processing and mach machine vision can sh surely support support faster client onboarding uh, reg tech firms can automate and streamline aspects of the compliance process. Uh, there are efforts to automate large portions of quantitative modeling processes that are central, that, that are central to the uh, investment decisions for a fund manager. Then we got into insurance. Insurance claims processes to reduce costs and improve customer experience. Uh, fraud investigation automation through automated patterns of potentially fraudulent activity such as similar claims found by other individuals. And this frees up investigators to focus, focus more on more complex aspects of, of their investigations. Um, and again, we go uh, to payments. In payments, we've got compliance. So in compliance realm, AI comes into aid for financial institutions to abide by anti-money laundering and financial crime regulations. So machine learning can enable sophisticated algorithms that learn to recognize suspicious behavior and automate the process of identifying, scoring, triaging, and resolving alerts. Um, and then we have data partnership. If you think about MasterCard and Google, uh, so uh, they, they actually signed a few years ago uh, partnerships where uh, a stockpile of payment data purchased by Google, Google allowed a trial subset of their advertiser to track when um, their online advertising leads to sale at physicalization location within uh, the United States. So I'll go quickly in the interest of time, sorry, I was a bit long, uh, uh, to all the initiatives taken for AI and big data. So yeah, the, in, in the GCC countries, it's uh, all GCC countries, Bahrain, KSA, um, sorry. Uh, they definitely, uh, sorry, hold on. Sorry. Uh, so I was saying that uh, Bahrain, KSA, uh, UAE, uh, they all had some initiatives both, both for AI and big data. So uh, for example, Bahrain implemented the Bahrain 2030 vision uh, uh, in big data that they had the open data strategy uh, KSA also uh, had opened a new center for AI of energy uh, on big data. They, um, uh, they, they launched a large scale cybersecurity initiative. Uh, same for Qatar. Qatar, uh, uh, the cabinet approved the establishment of a committee for Qatar artificial intelligence strategy. Uh, they uh, started a task moon program uh, to, uh, to enact Qatar as a leader of big data. And uh, sorry, in the ICT area, and UAE launched a strategy uh, uh, for AI aiming to create a virtual market with a high economic value. And also in on big data front, they um, launched a smart Dubai initiative in partnership with IBM. So I am done now. Uh, I will um, I will definitely switch on to the to the next. Um, uh, to the next uh, presentation. Ram, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ram, and uh, I take care of the uh, AI and big data portfolio for ZBI Global Services. So today, I'll spend the next 10 to 15 minutes on some of the AI initiatives uh, that we see, the kind of trends um, that we see is emerging in the industry. And I'll also walk you through some of the case studies related to that. 
So in the next slide, you uh, in next two or three slides, we'll talk about um, you know what Zebra does as a firm, and following that, I'll just jump onto the trends and the kind of use cases and things like that. Um, yeah. So if you can move to the next slide. Um, yeah, if you can, yeah. So uh, ZB as a firm, we started operating in 20, 2001. So we've been in industry for last 20 years. And uh, predominantly, as you can see, uh, with our global footprint, we've done exceedingly well in terms of uh, market capitalization and in terms of working with different uh, you know, domains and different kinds of customers. Uh, we work with top 30 uh, banking institutions globally. So we've done fairly well. And um, uh, most of our uh, top customers are banking customers at this stage. And uh, we carry a niche in terms of uh, launching digital banks as well. So that is also something uh, more than two or three projects that we've started in the last six months. Uh, so we've seen a great trend of adopting uh, technology to a level where the entire bank um, can be launched um, in a matter of few weeks or months and uh, with all sorts of operations automated, uh, with all sorts of reporting data being available in one place. And uh, the scale of transactions, the performance of the transactions are also something that is sustainable. So that's the kind of competency that we bring in um, in this area. So if you just go on to the next slide. Um, so Zevia is a firm. Uh, we have two products at the stage, Stack State and Instruct. Stack State is an AI ops product. Instruct is a training product. Um, we can definitely explain more about it when we talk in person or you know, in a detailed meeting regarding that. But overall, ZB as a firm, we provide uh, technology consulting and engineering services related to agile, DevOps, data, AI, architecture, testing, and things like that. Digital and enterprise being one of our strong focus area where uh, you know, microservices-based solutions, application development, design thinking, um, software development, a web app, um, all of those areas we cover end to end. And definitely cloud uh, DevSecOps is something that we are champions when it comes to uh, engineering. Uh, data and AI, you know, covering areas like data engineering, data science, reporting, data warehousing, um, AI, ML. So all of these areas uh, we've kind of executed uh, large scale engineering projects. And uh, quality assurance is another area where um, we excel and we have our own NOS solution as well called XAssure, um, which we kind of cater to our customers in terms of uh, building an end-to-end -end testing portfolio platform for them, uh, which you know is able to scale as per their enterprise needs. Lastly, we also have something called Zebia Academy, uh, which does B2B, B2C trainings and also has university programs. Uh, which can be, you know, you can view it online. So this is the kind of portfolio that we carry. And uh, we do have alliances. Um, as you can see, some of the alliances listed here. Uh, these are some of the key alliances. We do have other alliances in place as well. Um, overall, if you see in the next slide, um, there are six core, um, you know, pillars for our engineering services, center of excellence. One is agile. Uh, second one is digital enterprise that I spoke about. DevSecOps, when it comes to you know, Kubernetes, Terraform, Docker, uh, we're very good in that. Uh, cloud services, um, all the three major providers that we're working with. Uh, big data and data science is something that we specialize quite well and have tremendous amount of depth in it. And definitely, I think uh, having the quality assurance aspect end to end, uh, that is also a niche area. So when we work with our customers, uh, we bring in this entire a bandwagon of center of excellence where there are dedicated teams and people and specialists who are able to come in and deliver it as a program. So that's about you know Zebia in a nutshell. Um, now we will kind of go on to the BFSI uh, trends and um, what we see in the industry and things like that. So one of the interesting trends that we see in the industry right now is around you know how and why a particular um, you know for example a bank wants to implement AI. Basically, they want they have, what they've seen is that there, there is a marked amount of improvement in competitiveness uh, when they implement AI. And how do you think this is going to happen, right? Because for them, when, when they kind of think about technology or innovation, it is all about how do they expand the customer relationship? How do they actually uh, improve their presence? How do they actually streamline their operations and things like that? 
Let's look at the next slide, which actually goes a little bit deeper. So what this says is that majority of the benefits are from mid office and from front office operations. And majority of the cost savings are coming where, um, you know, the back end office, which is around core banking or uh, transactions being stored or analyzed and things like that, that is all fine. But then the entire integration and relationship to the front end or communicating the information to the customer, communicating the information to the portals and things like that, that is something that could be optimized, uh, you know, optimized and automated further. And that is where a lot of innovation and investment is going in um, at this particular case uh, in the industry as per research. And, the, and out of these things, in the next slide, you will be able to see that um, about 17 to 26%, the impact, major or majority of the impact is on customer engagement, right? Um, the kind of relationship they are able to have with the customer, the kind of conversions they're able to have in terms of sales, in terms of product sales, uh, conversion of product offerings, what is available for the customer, what information they can gather from the customer. That is the innovation, um, you know, that AI innovation is able to help uh, with and, and extract more information, which is in turn able to, you know, push back a lot of other intelligence back to the system. And, uh, you know, the banking executives are able to take better information um, and you know, take a better decision based on the information and, you know, utilize the technology. So in a nutshell, um, you know, front office, mid office operations, improvement in customer engagement. These are the three areas where AI is having a significant impact and majority of the cost savings from 2020 to 2023 is into these areas and the investment is here. So that's what we see in the industry. So now let's look at some of the use cases, right? How do they actually achieve it? You can see here, there are lots of use cases here, right? Uh, one related to KYC, um, sentiment analysis, um, you know, uh, NLP, NLG, and things like that. For example, let's con uh, combine call center agent matching with uh, KYC and ML, for example, right? So if you take video KYC, uh, where you're trying to provide a loan to a customer, or you're trying to activate a new account and things like that, it is a combination of organizing your agents to talk to your customers. On the other side, it is about recognizing the face of the customer, recognizing the identity card, recognizing the details related to the customer, combining them, processing them at speed in real time, and coming up with a successful verification, right? This entire journey has multiple AI solutions built into it, right? And it is also now possible to have this sort of a scale because of cloud as well, which is providing the scale and bandwidth to deliver complex solutions. So these are some of the you know, use cases that are actually impacting the front office and the mid office operations. You can see with the previous implementation, you had to deal with the front end where you submit a form, you go to the office, you sign something, you talk to the branch uh, manager, you come back. But here, it is all combined in one solution in a matter of four or five screens. So that's the level of sophistication AI is able to bring in. So if we just look at the next slide, um, you know, um, now we spoke up, I mean, previously we spoke about the AI use cases. Now let us look at uh, from a banking executive's perspective, right? I've just broken it down into seven different layers product offerings and pricing. So what happens here, um, if, if a customer is on online portal and they want to buy a credit card or they want to buy an EMI scheme or they want to go buy some loan, um, some gold and they want to kind of buy some investment product and things like that, there has to be a digital workflow which actually allows them to do that. And on top of it, an engine which determines what is the right fees, what is the right pricing structure, which should be linked to this particular transaction or purpose. So that is one level of innovation. A lot of people are actually focusing uh, when they are thinking about customer acquisition, customer uh, you know, retention and things like that. This is one layer of um, entire program that they're investing in. 
Second one is around Salesforce enablement. Um, can you just go back? Yeah. Uh, second one is around Salesforce enablement, where uh, we are talking about smart portals, which showcases a lot of information related to a customer and the products together and allows the relationship manager or the banking executive to take a call on the fly. Customer centricity, a um, lot of banks are investing on customer persona based products where they're able to see entire information related to deposits, wealth, investment, insurance, everything together in real time. So that gives them a lot of confidence and you know, support. Um, payment solutions, as you can see, uh, there is a lot of uh, widespread FinTech uh, apps integration that is available. So a lot of banks are now opening up um, to the integration piece of it. At the same time, they're also doing their own transaction analytics where they're getting down to the details of every transaction and trying to pick the intelligence from it uh, so that they're able to sustain better in the marketplace. Uh, digital solutions where a uh, lot of banks have invested already on virtual assistants, chatbots, and the subsequent NLP engine, which actually classifies, recognizes the context of data, and then triggers the backend forms and digital workflow to carry on the task, right? Um, fraud and security, what we see is that a lot of suspicious transaction analytics is being performed for internal systems. And a lot of models have been, uh, you know, apart from the business units, these are for the internal IT systems uh, related to the users, approvals, and things like that. And obviously the fraud and risk related uh, models are anyways in place. And there is also a lot of sophistication, a lot of investment into that as well. Uh, regulatory wise, yeah, compliance automation is something that a lot of banks are actually focusing on. Um, so these are the seven top areas uh, where we see we are also working with the banks and they're also investing in terms of programs. So if you just uh, go to the next slide, yeah. So um, a very quick uh, overview of the use case uh, that uh, I just wanted to talk about. So this is about a bank where you have the contact center, you have AML rules, you have credit card applications going online, you have campaigns running. So there is a lot of um, information that is required uh, for a particular customer, for a campaign, uh, for a transaction. And this has to be supplied to the contact center in, at the right time or to the fraud department or the audit department at the right time, forensic department and things like that. So we did a project with a customer where we built the backend data hub and then we invested in terms of building these solutions, fraud detection, customer 360, uh, predicting, uh, predictive AML, uh, AML alerts and things like that. So from 30 days, 60 days, three weeks of reporting, it came down to hours and seconds of reporting. So that's the difference you're able to uh, get with the adoption of technology. And at a large scale, you're able to process the information and get better results. Uh, so this is one of the scenarios and one of the use cases I wanted to explain with the benefit of technology. You're able to kind of reduce the time required to analyze the transactions and at the same time take decisions in a much more faster manner. So uh, this is another use case. Um, this is around anomaly detection. So what happens uh, when you're writing very complex models and when you're writing very complex uh, statistics around it, sometimes uh, the solution is not scalable. Sometimes there are a lot of false positives and things like that. So the entire logic was rewritten in machine learning uh, time series algorithm and uh, the entire implementation with the accuracy was validated to reduce the false positives, right? So what I mean by that is, if there are 100,000 false positives and you have limited staff and you want to implement a solution, it's not possible to go and verify 100,000 transactions, right? So that is the beauty of bringing in AI or uh, a technology advancement where from 100,000, you are able to reduce it to 100 anomalies, which are to be investigated and to be, you know, uh, audited. Uh, so that is the level of sophistication AI can bring in to solve some of the problems in this area as well for banking sector. Um, lastly, uh, in the next slide, um, you can see that um, uh, the first solution, which is a scanner app. So if you're doing any sort of OCR uh, application where you're extracting information for loan processing, 
um, things like that. So that is a cognitive services solution that can be built for a bank, loan processing, KYC, ID verification, and things like that. Uh, so that is something that we do for a lot of our customers. NLP engine for building a, a link between your transactions, customers, and brands. So that is also something that we have done for the banks. Data platform as a service on a multi-cloud environment, on an on-premise environment. Uh, we've done that sort of implementation as well. Um, you know, customer loyalty churn analytics is something that we do a lot uh, for our existing customers in bank as well. Uh, next best action, um, you know, is something that uh, we've done for a lot of banks at this stage. And there are at least about three or four other products uh, that we've built for the banks. Uh, so if you're interested, feel free to contact us. More than happy to discuss that further. But I think overall, um, in a nutshell, I think NLP implementation, machine learning implementation for about 17 to 18 different use cases in bank and uh, building solutions at scale, that is something that the industry is definitely going towards. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation for today. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, uh, look, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Ram. Very, very interesting. Um, um, before, before jumping to the to the to the next presentation, I, I just wanted to uh, to share with you um, uh, a couple of questions. So, sure. Uh, honestly, I saw that the industry industry coverage provided by CBA is, is truly impressive. So, uh, have you experienced significant dif significant difference in the uh, type of technologies requested across uh, different industries? Do you have any any example for that? So um, I think majority of the times, if you think about it, um, you know, banks have a very large spectrum. There is cards technology, there is core banking technology, there is SMS technology. So there are a lot of peripheral systems that the banks have to deal with. Then along with that, um, they also have to then build an aggregation engine in the backend, uh, which holds the entire data set at a raw level, processes it and then is able to do a real time streaming for all sorts of customer offers, transaction alerts, et cetera, et cetera. So typically um, a cloud implementation for a bank is something that is very scalable right now. Um, data center wise, I think technology wise, uh, there is only few limited uh, technology platforms that is available for on-premise that is being around Cloudera, which is fantastic. And uh, in terms of uh, cloud, uh, definitely, Azure, AWS, GCP, all the three platforms are something that is preferred by majority of banking platform uh, users. Understood, thank you. And uh, the, the other, the other um, question that was popping in my mind, right? Uh, what are actually the major constraints that you typically encounter when embarking into an implementation of any of your AI solutions? Right, so as I said, uh, when, when banks are dealing with multiple layers of solutions, right? Uh, there is core banking system that doesn't talk to a card system or some omni-channel system and things like that. The grain of information is at a different level in every system. So um, when you embark on a AI journey, you need to bring all those systems into a, a grain where it is easily readable, understandable, and can be linked together. Um, so one of the constraints is access to those systems are relevant data set and uh, the preparation of the data for developing a ML based model um, and uh, getting that data set ready uh, in a manner that we can actually solve the problem. That is something uh, that you know takes time and not, that is something that is not something that is easy. Uh, so that we've, that's what we've experienced, but yeah. I think availability and access uh, to the system and data is something that is a problem sometimes. Okay, thank you, Ram. Truly really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will move ahead. Uh, so uh, Ravi uh, from Mixaware is um, uh, is uh, is now uh, leading the stage. Please, Ravi, over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Vince, and uh, thank you, Ram. And hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Ravi from Hexaware. Uh, we are. Uh, uh, we are a well-known uh, well brand. We've been in the business for about 30 years, but we call ourselves a billion dollar startup. Uh, that's, that's what we are. Uh, we will be closing a billion dollars this, uh, this year. And banking and, uh, is very, very important uh, part of that journey. And uh, at Hexaware, there are three core principles. 
which we believe in, which is automate everything, cloudify everything, and transform the customer experience. In everything that we do, we follow these three principles uh, to the spirit of it. So yes, uh, uh, we've been uh, we've been fortunate enough to work with uh, the large banks, the small banks, the mid-tier banks, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, and it's been very interesting today, right? What 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 I heard from you, Vince, and then from Ram, you know, uh, about what how AI and data and big data and, and all those technical terms that you are trying to explain at the beginning. You didn't fall asleep meanwhile because <laughs> my concern is that possibly initially there was too much notion. That, 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 that took me back to my computer science class back in college. Uh, I wish some of my college buddies were listening to this. Uh, uh, so, uh, so yes, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's tough, right, to explain these things to people uh, and, and let alone explain how do you, how do you actually implement those things in real life, right? The beautiful results that Ram uh, uh, shared with us, right? That is possible and it is possible. How do you actually start? If I were an IT leader at a bank, what do I do? Uh, most banks already have most of the softwares that are required. They've already invested uh, in some kind of uh, automation and some kind of tools and definitely they have a huge legacy of technology debt. That's the reality of the situation. How do, we, how do we help them to actually leverage what they have in their real estate and exactly uh, help them uh, train the dragon, right? And, and, and train, help, them, help them fly. Like how do you make their own data and the, and the IT landscape actually become, make it a real asset, make it work for them? So we've been uh, racking our brains at Hexaware uh, within the banking team. Uh, and then discussing with several of our customers, hey, you've invested X million dollars, you ran three transformation programs. And as Ram rightly said, core banking doesn't talk to omni-channel, omni-channel doesn't talk to cards and so on and so forth. The problems still exist. Yeah. What do we do? And all these brilliant topics that uh, wins you just told us, right? Deep learning, machine learning, and all that stuff. Uh, how, how do we actually bring it all together? How do we put a method to this madness and actually take it step by step and, 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 and unravel this mystery? That's something uh, that we actually, uh, out of a personal need and also uh, after intense discussions and interactions with the leaders from the bank side, uh, we've come up with a, with, a, with a model which helps any bank actually to actually implement all that great stuff that that, that you were saying in the beginning of this discussion and which Ram shared. So if you could go to the next slide, I would like to introduce to you uh, a set of discrete nine steps that we actually follow. It's, uh, we internally call it the butterfly because just as an emperor butterfly requires nine steps uh, from being a caterpillar to be a full fresh butterfly, this is how uh, your data take, takes wings. And this is how AI, can be brought into your operations inside your bank. And what do you do? It's irrespective of the tool, irrespective of the technology that you use. What, what happens is uh, you need to organize your data in a particular format so that you can feed it to all these powerful tools that have come up. Because today, the art of the possible is humongous. So it's a, it's a nine step process and let me break it down, right? The first five steps are basically business centric, or, or, or domain context centric, then last four steps are extremely technology intensive. So that's the real uh, merger of the two. Now, what comes out of this? If I follow this nine, nine steps in a bank, well, uh, I get to a point uh, based on my maturity uh, that I'm able to predict the business events based on the IT logs and traces that are there in my uh, ecosystem. I'm able to connect everything uh, in real time based on a business context. So based on my customer behavior, my consumer behavior, I'm able to connect the dots and predict the next action that the customer would require rather than make the customer come to me and say, hey, can you give me this? Instead of I'm telling the banker in real time that Vince will need these three products in the next two quarters. 
I may be roughly right. I may be 60% wrong. No problem. But it, hey, it doesn't, doesn't hurt because there are a lot of business intelligence systems out there and people have invested a lot in that. That'll, that'll do this. But all that is after the fact. Nobody does it before the fact. So this, this step, these steps, let me just walk you through, take a few minutes and walk you through, uh, is that the first is we need to get a context of the enterprise. What is that the bank is trying to do? And then have uh, a wireframed version of the map, the enterprise map, which we call the GPS of the enterprise, wherein the business events and the IT transactions are connected. So every business event like account opening, customer onboarding, uh, uh, credit initiation, all these business events, what are the IT transactions which cuts across multiple IT platforms are associated with it? And what are the underlying technologies behind this? This mapping has to be there, which is what we call the GPS of the enterprise or the maps, right? And once you have that, uh, it's also known as better maps, B-E-T-R, better maps, that's how we call it. Uh, that, that gives that connect. Now, once you have that, you will have a deluge of information in any bank. That's our personal experience. We have to put the right level of signals, right levels of filters, and talk to the key stakeholders and say, hey, tell me your top 10 business transactions which keep you awake at night. Like if these things don't work, uh, everything will go south. What are the top 10 things? Tell me that. And then we do the value mapping and the effort sizing for that. And then we bring in the IT gin bank, put in all the IT applications that Tom spoke about, all those technology stuff, uh, identify the right tools. Every tool is great. Every tool is fit for purpose. So we have to identify the right tools for the right kind of uh, uh, le level of granularity you need. And then once you do that, you start getting a bigger deluge of information. That is when the problem actually starts. You may think that you have solved the problem. That is when the problem actually starts. You know why? because you have opened all the floodgates across the bank. Now then what you do is again use this better map that you've got and then uh, funnel that information into the right pockets. So what happens is you, you get to a point wherein you're able to connect your service level agreements to your operating level agreements and your operating level agreements to your business level agreements and business level agreements to an experience level agreements. Now service level agreements are nothing but like it has systems have to be running all the time. Uh, they cannot, like there has to be five nines and all that stuff, everybody knows. And OLA would be right, if there are six hops in a bank to complete a process, we make it two. And then when you get to uh, uh, a business level agreement, you say that customer onboarding, customer, uh, the abandoned rate of my customer onboarding process should be less than 3% or less than 8%. If I'm sure any banker who is out there who's listening to this, uh, they will just fall off the chair when I say 8% and 3% because these are great numbers. Uh, when you, uh, when talking about when you go online, apply for a credit card, they ask you for a bunch of details. And then in the middle of it, you feel fatigued and then you leave. That's called abandonment. So that rate, how do I reduce that rate? And I sign up for that. I'll ensure that I will use the past transactions that customers have done in my IT landscape, use an AI engine to clean out the patterns and actually predict that a person with this demography, this background and this persona is likely to abandon at this point. And hence, we need to fix this process proactively before it breaks down. That is what this model will help a bank achieve. And this works, this is product agnostic. This is a method which we have uh, come up and successfully uh, leveraged this uh, ac across the board and helped our partners to, to realize the value uh, that they were seeking. So those are the kind of things that we are looking at and uh, the art of the possible using artificial intelligence and data in, in, the, in the operations of a bank is what, uh, what is actually, I see the future in. Well, it's great to build a digital bank grounds up. It's great to transform existing applications from technology A to technology B. That's all exciting stuff that always happens from time to time. But this helps you to leverage what you have already invested and get greater return. So the prediction is four out of 10 transactions going forward 
uh, from 2022 are likely to follow a method or a model similar to this in any bank. That's the, that's the, that's the market spread and expectation for this. So uh, that's something that we are extremely kicked about and based on our experience. Now, having said that, I've told you the method, how to do it. If I were a banker or an IT, IT leader working in a bank, what are the first five or six things that I need to do in order to start, make myself ready to even implement this? If you could go to the next slide, you see, you will see that uh, there are some basic stuff that one needs to do in order to identify the hot buttons. As I said, if these 10, thing, 10 things don't work, everything will fall down. And then you invest in immersive analytics, which means you don't pull out a report and then try to find, figure out what is going wrong. The report should be generated automatically, analyzed, and the analytics coming out of that should be actionable. And the person or the persona who is responsible for acting on it gets that in their to-do uh, to, to -do list. So the problem is not only detected ahead of time, the fix is identified ahead of time by correlating historical information using AI and data. And then the person who is supposed to fix it, it could be a machine, it could be man. So no, that person gets that in the to-do list. This is what you need to start thinking about because your ultimate objective, if you are a banker and if you are working uh, in the IT department of a bank, you should always look at having continuous oversight because the way things are changing, the IT department is expected to advise the business, the banker saying that, uh, Mr. X was a very good credit score today, three quarters down the line, his credit score is likely to go down or maybe further up. You may want to right fit the products that you are putting in front of that person. So this continuous oversight is something we need to have based on the data which is available within the bank. So we've got a very interesting example, which is in the next uh, slide. Uh, we've actually helped uh, uh, a bank out east wherein we were able to provide a 360 degree view of the fund management in a single place using all these technologies, methods and models that I've been talking to you about and uh, provide a great degree of data ownership to, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the bankers and provide them with a single source of proof. What happens is then the efficiency rate improved by just 30% and the, and the banker's satisfaction index just hit the roof. IT became a value center. It stopped become, being a cost center. So that's, that's the, the uh, what to say, the serendipitous fallout of this whole model of actually action, uh, bringing AI and data to life instead of you know, just looking at them with wow and awe saying that, oh, this is all tough stuff. So no, it is possible, it is doable. In fact, uh, business areas like anti-financial uh, anti crime, anti-money laundering as uh, Ram uh, shared an example, right? It helped uh, these technologies and methods and models helped another bank in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, wherein we were able to deliver them better business insights and uh, an efficiency rate was increased by 40%. And the biggest thing was, the IT owner was able to predict what will go wrong or go right in the business over the next uh, quarter. Every quarter they were able to predict. And they had a accuracy rate of 30% to 60%. That varies on the maturity of the landscape, but that is good enough. Right? So that's to start because we have just begun. The AI and data journey in banks has just begun. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I Thank you. I enjoyed sharing my experience. Uh, Win, yeah, you're on mute, Win. Win, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I did something wrong with the configurations here. You, you're able to listen to me now, right? To hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was saying, so, so thanks. Very, very nice, uh, nice and interesting insights from both of you. I also have a question from you, from you, Ravi. I was wondering. Um, 
if you if you think about the um, the data access, so data in essence is everything, right? When we when we thinking about our modules, the accuracy of your model actually depends on the amount of data that can you can handle, right? So I was wondering, have, have you have you ever experienced any any type of uh, let's say regulatory constraints related to data access that would have limited the effectiveness of your AI solutions across the uh, geographies where you implemented your your solutions? Uh, definitely, uh, uh, what have what we normally do is we analyze the data and then uh, then uh, bubble it up and we actually normalize it in, and map it to personas. That's a standard way of doing it because there is a lot of uh, non-public private information that is usually asso associated with banking and banking has a lot of strict regulations. So it does impact, but then when we use patterns, right? We use patterns to overlay on that and try to make the data as useful as it can be. Well, the short answer to that question is yes, if you, if you, if you take, don't have any regulations, I can do much better, but then if the, the data is not secure, I will not want to give my data to a bank, right? So, right. so it, it's a catch-22 thing. Right, right. And I have an open question to, uh, actually to both of you, Rana and Ravi. Uh, so in your machine learning solution, is there a specific type of learning for which you, um, yeah, which you mainly use among the supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement learning? Uh, I was wondering if, if yes, uh, if there is any, if there is any business or technical reason why to use one specific um, type of learning technique um, to another. Uh, Ravi, you can go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you, can you repeat the question, please, if you don't no, mind? Right. My, my question is very is very simple. It's just I was wondering. So we have different type of, of learning, right? In in, yes. in machine learning solutions. So I was I was wondering, do you have any uh, type of learning that you prefer among others? So we we spoken about supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Is there anything among the three of them that you usually use more in your uh, in your uh, systems, or or do you in your solutions, or do you them. See, uh, I'll go, uh, if it's okay with Ram, I'll go first. Now I get it. See, in a, in, a, in a support kind of a situation, right, where I am responsible to run the bank, uh, it is always supervised learning that is preferred. Uh, yeah. And then, then it gets added on to the intelligence and then the patterns get added and the intelligence improves incre incrementally. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a given. But then if you are doing something new, like for example, you are establishing a grounds up new bank and you're reimagining the whole thing. Um, and you're like questioning, hey, why do we need private banking? Um, why? Uh, questioning the basic principles. That is when you need this huge models that will run um, unsupervised learning. It will sneak into various other statistical models, give you the output uh, and, and in real time tell you what you're thinking is, uh, really useless or extremely path-breaking. So those are the kind of things. But in day-to-day, -day, if you ask me, it's all so supervised learning is something that is really useful in real life today. Yeah, yeah. You Ram agree, right? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. So, and what happens is uh, there's always the kind of use case as well, right? So if yeah. there is a score, uh, prediction, risk assessment, uh, fraud detection, image classification, you use generally supervised. But when there is like millions of images or, uh, you know, they're trying to do something like a text mining on millions of banking transactions or clustering or something like that, then maybe the data scientists will pick on supervised learning approach and things like that. Depends on the types of use case. But yeah, right. uh, I think it's better to bet on the ones that is going to work for the bank. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Look, um, so uh, I think we are already at, uh, at the end of the, of the webinar. I really to thank you for uh, the nice intervention, for the, the great insights you, you, you gave us. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.